when you receive the youtube uh, live means you can tell to sudhir he can uh, start the video just a second i will check it sir mm hmm hmm Yes, sir. We are on live. Can we start? Uh, live. We are. We are in live, sir. We are in live. Okay. Okay. Start, sir. the three day third day of our symposium on recent trends in pharmaceutical research organized by department of pharmaceutics sri vidyaniketan college of pharmacy i would like to welcome today's eminent speaker professor k v ramanamurthy garu principal au college of pharmaceutical sciences andhra university visakhapatnam i extend my hearty welcome to the beloved principal dr anna balaji garu organizing committee faculty and dear students now i invite mrs a sweta ma'am to introduce today's keynote speaker it's over to you sweta ma'am Good morning to one and all. It is my honor to introduce today's speaker, Professor K. V. Ramanamurthy Garu. K. V. Ramanamurthy Professor K. V. Ramanamurthy Garu has completed his B. Pharmacy and Pharmacy courses and postgraduate diploma in Applied Statistics, Statistics in first class from Andhra University, Visakhapatnam. He was awarded with PhD in the year 1987 from Andhra University. He is having Thirty-five years of teaching and administrative experience. From 1982 to 2000, December 2018, he was worked as UGC Fellowship Lecturer, Associate Professor, and as a professor in Andhra University. Currently, he is working as the Professor and Principal of AU College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Andhra University, Visakhapatnam. He has guided 62 PhDs and 88 MPharm projects. presently four students were pursuing phd under his guidance he has published 180 research papers professor k v ramanamurthy garu has delivered nearly 95 lectures at various scientific conferences he has successfully completed 12 research projects and having five patents he is a life member in professional bodies such as indian pharmaceutical association Association of Pharmaceutical Teachers of India, Registered Pharmacists, Andhra Pradesh State Pharmacy Council, Indian Pharmacy Graduates Association. He has visited many countries and presented research papers, delivered invited talks, and underwent trainings. He has worked in various vigilance and 
administrative he has worked in various administrative activities such as vigilance committee member and delivered invited talks and underwent trainings he has worked in various administrative activities like placement and training officer academic coordinator of andhra university chairman for board of studies of andhra university au college of pharmaceutical sciences member consent for operation in andhra pradesh pollution control board and member for environment waste disposal committee he was also involved in other activities like inspector of pharmacy council of india and act he is the editorial board member for various journals sorry he is also the member for scientific screening committee for aaps usa referee for international scientific publications he is the member of board of studies of sri venkateshwara university tirupati and acharya nagarjuna university he has received various prestigious awards such as awarded with dr lvg nargans professor cj sishu award best researcher award in pharmacy by association of pharmaceutical teachers of india in the year 2019 he was awarded with state best teacher award in pharmacy by andhra pradesh state government on september 5 2015 he has received dr sarvepalli radhakrishna best academician of the year 2010 by andhra university he was awarded best teacher of the year award by association of pharmaceutical teachers of india in the year 2009 he was awarded by andhra pradesh state government scientist award in the year 2007 he was awarded as best researcher award in 2005 by andhra university he was selected by andhra university for the award of international study and research grant for conducting research in foreign countries for a period of 2 months worth rupees 1 lakh it is my privilege to introduce such an eminent personality professor k v ramanamurthy garu to the today's session thank you sir thank you madam now the session is handed over to the eminent speaker professor k v ramanamurthy garu sir i request you to please start the presentation sir yeah thank you very much for the nice introduction about me a uh, very good morning to all the faculty members principal and the participants of today's webinar today i would like to present the approaches for brain targeting stratagems what i named is stratagems because we have to have the targeting of the drugs to the brain in a specified way overcoming different obstacles that are faced during the transport of the drugs to the brain as well as the approaches that are to be adopted for designing a suitable dosage form for overcoming these obstacles and deliver the drug at the right time at a right concentration at the right place in the brain to overcome the difficulties that are faced in the form of different diseases by the brain what is the speciality of the brain it is a unique target organ for drug delivery because of its complexity and it is having approximately 2% of the body weight and though it is having very less body uh, comparable to the total body it is having only 2% but 20% of the body energy is being consumed by the brain for different functions of the body and there are two major barriers for the transport of the drugs into the brain and dark one is the blood brain barrier the other one is blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier so what is this blood brain barrier and it is also called as hematoencephalic barrier and it is a dynamic interface that is going to control the entry of essential molecules hello oh pp share share all right travel Yes. Now is it okay? It is starting, sir.
just going to share the first slide where uh, it is a unique organ which is comprising about 2% of the body weight and consumes about 20% of the body energy that is generated and there are two obstacles one is the blood brain barrier the other one is blood cerebrospinal blood spine cerebrospinal fluid barrier the blood brain barrier is a dynamic interface that is going to control the entry of essential molecules like blood sugar and oxygen into the brain and it stops about 95% of the molecules for the drug development other than this blood sugar and oxygen into the brain because of that it is going to be a big hurdle for the transport of drugs and what are the barriers that are going to prevent the entry of these 95% of the molecules they are the layer of endothelial cells interconnected through tight junctions and the basal membrane consisting of basal lamina or astrocytes and basal lamina of endothelial cells and there are some protrusion like things which are called as astrocytes and they will also strengthen the basal membrane such that all these are going to cause the prevention of the entry of these 95% of molecules majorly the drugs and the blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier it is also called as hemato liquor barrier and it consists of the cerebrospinal fluid and blood that is getting separated between them and choroidal epithelial cells which are interconnected by tight junctions and the basal membrane and endothelium of pyometer capillaries containing fenestrations these are the three obstacles which are going to prevent the entry of the drugs into the cerebrospinal fluid and compared to the brain these are not that much concerned for the uh, prevention of the entry of the drug molecules and there are different transport mechanisms that are there for the transport of the drugs one is called as paracellular aqueous pathway transcellular lipophilic pathway transport of proteins by using the efflux pumps and receptor mediated transcytosis and adsorptive transcytosis and cell mediated transcytosis etc so all these are going to operate on different mechanisms which i am going to discuss in the coming slides the major problem for the hydrophilic drugs is the paracellular transport of these hydrophilic drugs are completely absent in the brain and there is a chance of transcellular transport by passive diffusion and the controlling factors for this transport are the molecular weight of the drug which should be less than 50 daltons and the compounds must be completely unionized in state and the log p value of the drug should be close to 2 and the number of hydrogen bond should not be more than 10 so if a drug molecule is going to fit into these four criteria then we can think about transcellular transport of this particular drug by passive diffusion and the other alternative that is our disposal is the altering the integrity of the blood brain barrier or we have to create some interaction or affinity of these drug molecules for the receptors that are going to be expressed by the blood brain barrier such that the drug can easily cross this particular blood brain barrier and coming to the dosage form design one should seriously think about the different properties of this particular drug coming with starting with physical chemical properties of the drugs sir, like lipophilicity molecular weight molecular charge chemical structure chemical conformation and the polymorphic nature and biopharmaceutical and pharmacokinetic factors that should be considered are what is it the systemic absorption of this particular drug how the drugs are getting transported across the membranes and what are the affinities that the drugs are going to have for the receptors and the efflux proteins like pgp and the different carriers and how the drug is getting distributed in the body what are the metabolism mechanisms that are there and finally how the drug is getting cleared of the body and regarding the dosage forms we need to have the preparation formulation and additional agents which are going to play a very important role which are the excipients and the concentration gradient of the drug and polymer that means whenever a drug is formulated how this concentration gradient is going to influence its release from the dosage form what is the particle size what is the flexibility and permeability of this particular drug molecule for crossing this blood brain barrier and last but not the least is the dissolution rate and physiological factors that physical physiological characteristics of the site of the administration 
cerebral blood flow and pathological state of the brain are going to be very important parameters for deciding a, deciding a suitable dosage form. What are the diseases which are going to have the treatment of this particular brain targeting? They are classified as G degenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's disease. Non-degenerative comes under epilepsy, narcolepsy, and infectious encephalitis and meningitis, and cerebrovascular diseases, transient ischemic attack, and brain tumors, and other thing is paralysis and quadriplegia. quadriplegia. So degenerative disorders, we all know what is Alzheimer's disease. I'm not going to uh, talk much about it. So finally, the patient is going to lose his memory and it causes the dementia at the amount mostly prevalent in the older adults. And multiple sclerosis is a disease where the immune system is going to attack the myelin sheet of the nerve fibers of the brain, spinal cord and optic nerve. And this myelin sheet becomes inflamed and gradually destroyed and it leaves the areas of scar tissue and thus that is going to disrupt the electrical impulses between the brain and other parts of the body. And Parkinson's disease, it is going to be caused by degeneration of the nerve cells at substantia nigra, and which is going to hinder the movement and they are going to have the, uh, losing the ability to produce uh, the important chemical called as dopamine. So, the non-degenerative diseases are uh, epilepsy and narcolepsy. We all know what is the problem of the epilepsy. It is a seizure and it is a sudden alteration of behavior due to a temporary change in the electrical functioning of the brain and that may briefly affect the consciousness, movement or sensations. And narcolepsy is a sleep disorder and it is a, a, a characterized by excessive sleepness and it also associated with cataplexy a disorder which is called as partial or total loss of muscle, muscle control, and it is triggered by strong emotions such as laughter. And infectious diseases are encephalitis and meningitis. Encephalitis is caused by the viral infection, and it may result in personality changes, seizures, weakness, and other symptoms. Whereas meningitis may be caused both by viral as well as the bacterial infection, and bacterial infection is very, very dangerous. And if it is not properly diagnosed and treated immediately, it will be very fatal. And frankly, I'm sorry to say that my father lost his life because of bacterial meningitis within a short span of hardly one and a half days because he was not diagnosed and he was not treated. And a simple penicillin treatment itself is sufficient for treating this. But unfortunately, by the time it is diagnosed, spread to the total spinal cord and brain, and I'm sorry for saying this. Cerebrovascular accidents are all caused by a transient ischemic attack, which is like a stroke, and it produces the similar symptoms, but it lasts only for a few minutes and may, cause, may not cause a permanent damage. And the cause for this development of this ischemic, uh, transient ischemic attack is the building up of the deposits of plaques, which is called as atherosclerosis in an artery or one of its branches that supplies oxygen and nutrients to the brain. And they can decrease the blood flow through an artery that leads to the development of a clot. And finally, it may develop in the form of a stroke at a later date. Brain tumors are most common problems nowadays being faced by many of the patients. And it's a mass of abnormal cells growth in the brain and it may generate within the brain itself or from its lining and they are called as primary brain tumors and they may be benign or malignant. But the tumors that are generated from the body are termed as secondary and they are metastatic brain tumors which are always malignant tumors. So if you look at the tumor vasculature, this is the normal vasculature of any vessel Whereas in the tumor vasculature, there may be a temporary occlusion of the vessel or the AV shunt mechanism that is developed. That means two are going to be joined together or there is a break in the 
vessel or they may be forming the blind ants or sometimes uh, they uh, they may have the development of less oxygen supply to the blood vessels so paralytic conditions will be losing the muscle function in the part of the body which may be accident or a medical condition may be a major cause and it may be localized or general or it may be partial or complete and it may be a temporary or a permanent whereas quadriplegia is a tetraplegia or it is also called as a tetraplegia and it is called as paralysis of four limbs and it is caused by damage to the brain or the spinal cord at a high level starting with c1 to c7 in particular so what are the approaches for targeting the drugs to the brain because in normal therapy of any disease we generally formulate a dosage form and it will be ingested through different routes and it reaches to the different affected parts by the blood circulation because of the barriers which are already discussed like blood brain barrier or blood blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier it is very difficult to trans transport these drugs directly into the brain and we need to target these drugs specifically to reach to the brain and there are different approaches that are available for targeting the drugs to the brain and they are classified into three major groups called as invasive non invasive and miscellaneous and invasive technique involves intracerebral implants intraventricular infusion or disruption of the blood brain barrier and in non invasive methodologies we have the chemical biological and colloidal approaches and in miscellaneous we may be having the two different approaches called as intranasal and antrophoretic approaches so what are the intracerebral implants so we will be preparing a dosage form in the form of an implant and drug is added to a polymer and compressed to form a form a pellet or a film wrappers these are implanted intracranially for bypassing the blood brain barrier like this and they are made to release the drug in a, at a particular local area of the brain in a sustained fashion and this is going to be a combination of diffusion and hydrolytic polymer degradation because the polymer that is going to be used for preparation of this implant will be degraded slowly by hydrolytic reaction and the drug is going to be released at a very slow rate by the mechanism of diffusion and it may last for the release of the drug for about 2 to 3 months as per the design of the particular implant and normally this type of approach is used for the treatment of meningitis and the the materials that are going to be used are glycopeptides or aminoglycoside antibiotics because it is an infection that is caused and they have developed the programmable microchips which are intracranially implanted to control the release of the drug at the targeted sites and they are classified as microelectromechanical systems or passive chips and there may be a chance of incorporating only a single dose or multiple doses into this particular system by using this check technology and they are having a drug filled reservoir on a silicon chip which are going to provide a very highly programmable release of the drug at the targeted site and they have carried out the pre clinical studies by using the drug temozolomide and carnistine using mems and the passive chip were also used in rude in treating the rodent gly gly gliosarcoma model and the device effectively delivered the drug and the increased the survival time in nynal glioma model and chemotherapeutic effect of bcnu on fisher gly gliosarcoma rat model was also tried using the passive microchip model and it effectively reduced the tumor volume compared to the empty device so these are all the pre clinical studies that gave very good successful outcome of these programmable chips for incorporating into the brain tissue and long term implant study is also taken up by some researchers for prediction of the seizures in a clinically useful in, uh, in a in a clinical way for treating the patient suffering with epilepsy for improving their safety and increase in independence and allow the acute treatment the multi center clinical feasibility study that was carried out for the safety and efficacy of a long term implant seizure advisory system and it is able to predict the seizure likelihood and quantify the seizures in adults with drug resistant 
focal seizures. And intracranial electroencephalographic monitoring was also feasible using this particular technology in ambulatory patients with drug resistant epilepsy, in which the implant is kind of placed in the brain and it is going to be controlled by a, a physiologic system and it can be easily monitored by a handheld monitor like this, as depicted in the picture. But what are the limitations of this particular treatment of implants? It is a traumatic drug delivery strategy because it is an invasive technique where we need to open the certain part of the brain for implanting this particular implant. And we cannot have higher dosage of the drug in, because of the limitation of the implant size. And there is a chance of drug distribution to the surface of the brain via, via intraventricular drug infusion but not properly delivered to the brain parenchyma, which is very essential for delivery of the drug for treating a particular disease. And distribution in the brain by diffusion decreases exponentially with the distance. Suppose if the drug is not properly placed, that means the implant is not properly placed at the right site, the diffusion of the drug may take a long time and sometimes it may decrease exponentially from the point of insertion of the implant to the point of action in the brain which is a major drawback of this particular implant. And the injection site has to be mapped to get efficacy and to overcome the problem associated with this particular drug diffusion. And it is also going to damage the brain parenchyma sometimes. And packaging capacity of infusion is also very small. So all these are the major limitations of application of these implants. And we have the second alternative intraventricular infusion and with the intermittent bolus injections, we can have the local delivery of the particular drug causing high drug concentration in the CNS with minimal systemic exposure and toxicity. In the case of transport of drugs from the oral or other routes of administration to the brain, the other, other parts of the body are going to be exposed for the toxicity of the particular drug which is ingested into the body. Whereas with this intraventricular infusion, we can overcome that particular difficulty and we can localize the drug concentration only in the CNS of the interest. And there is a low speed of diffusion and that restricts the tissue uptake of the drug by the other small molecular drugs especially, and even for large molecules also, they can be localized and they cannot penetrate deep into the tissues of the other parts of the brain. And enzymatic inactivation and binding or sequestration by brain cells along the diffusion path is also very much reduced because the drug concentration is very much localized at the particular affected part. So the major advantage is local delivery of this particular anti-cancer drugs to the intracranial target that is contemplated. But the disadvantage is the chance of CNS infection because it is also an invasive technology and there is a catheter obstruction may also come because if you look at the picture, they are going to infuse the drug from the outside into a particular part of the brain by using the syringe methodology. During this process, there is a chance of blockage of this particular catheter at any part and washing or anything is going to be a big issue. And because it is going to be an invasive technique, there is a chance of infection. Nitrosourea and methotrexate are used in different clinical trials with promising results by using this particular technology. This is one more important development. This is called desire and a very small placed under the scalp and it is connected to a catheter and which is in one of the ventricles of the brain. So the drug solutions are subcutaneously injected into the implanted device, that means into this, and it will be delivered to the ventricles by manual pressing of this. So the greatest utility of this delivery methodology has been in cases where high drug concentrations in the CSF or in the intermediary adjacent parenchyma are desired. And it is used to treat the brain tumors, leukemia, lymphoma, or other diseases and there are different agents like BCNU or its analogs, methotrexate, adriamycin, etc., are being tried by using this OMIA reservoir technology. The second approach, what is going to be used is the blood brain 
barrier disruption. And there are different methods that are there for achieving this particular technology by using convection enhanced delivery, which is called as CED delivery, or osmotic BBBD strategy, or ultrasound mediated BBBD strategy, or biochemical BBBD strategy. So what is this convection enhanced delivery? So here, the catheters that are stereotactically placed using the cranial burr holes and the therapeutic agents are administered by micro infusion pumps through these catheters and the positive pressure that is developed at the tip of the cannula is going to push the drug molecules further away from the cannula trip into the affected part. You can clearly see the methodology that is being adopted for using this convection enhanced delivery. So the major advantage of this particular approach is high concentration that can be attained in the brain and it can have the CNS targeted effects and lower systemic side effects, large drug distribution volume, flexible therapy protocol and consistent drug concentration. Again, the disadvantages include the invasive technology, it may take long infusion times and unpredictable drug concentration. Though we claim that we can predict the drug concentration at the site, there are some times where there are chances of developing the unpredictable drug distributions at the particular affected site and potential high intracranial pressures. Because we are introducing this drug solution from extraneous source, there is a chance of development of the high intracranial pressures and last but not the least, the local toxicity. And to enhance the drug lo localization to the tumor site with minimal toxicity, effect of seed of liposomes containing tomogolomide was studied in rats for treatment of glioblastoma multiforme. But here, the longer survival or smaller tumor, vo tumor volumes were not exhibited by this TMZ liposomal treatment in comparison with TMZ in solution. Only significantly lower edema volumes were observed. And hence, the study concluded that there was no significant difference that was used for TMJ, TMJ via CD over drug solution. That means they claimed the failure of the study rather than the success of the study, except the significantly lower edema volumes in the particular treatment case. The second approach is osmotic blood brain disruption strategy. So the transient osmotic disruption of the blood brain barrier or blood, blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier are blood tumor barriers, which can be obtained by intra-arterial infusion of a hypo or hyper osmotic agents. So normally mannitol is going to be used as hyper osmotic agent, and it is going to cause the shrinkage of the cerebrovascular endothelial cells, and that's producing the disruption of the inter-endothelial tight junctions for several hours. So you can see this is the normal capillary what is seen. And after the introduction of this particular hyperosmotic agent like mannitol, there is going to be a shrinkage of this particular normal capillary wherein drug can penetrate through, the, through these shrinked capillaries into the brain and they can transiently approach the brain. And there are other materials like arabinose, lactamide, saline, urea, and radiographic contrast agents are also used. And it was earlier used by Rappaport in 1972, and now is being used in preclinical and even some clinical studies also for disrupting the blood brain barrier. So they have studied the durable response in embryonal and certain germ cell tumors of the central nervous system is unsatisfactory. The reason is the technique is less specific and inefficient. And in phase two clinical trial, carboplastin of methotestate-based intra-arterial chemotherapy and osmotic blood-brain barrier disruption was evaluated for overall survival, time to progression, and toxicity. Survival and toxicity data appearing promising. In the first case, it is not encouraging, but in the second case, it is slightly promising. The reasons for failure is this technique is less specific and inefficient because we have to disrupt these particular capillaries which are affected due to the tumor and we have to identify and then only the disruption by osmotic process is possible. And transport of plasma proteins to CNS because the 
capillaries are disrupted, there is a chance of transport of plasma proteins to the CNS causing some interaction. Disturbed glucose um, uptake because the capillaries are getting disturbed. The microembolism, there is a possibility. Neurotoxicity of cerebral tissues, altered brain functions, and technically re technicality related issues are also sometimes there. The other approach is ultrasound mediated blood brain barrier disruption. Ultrasound waves reversibly and transiently open the blood brain barrier. So majority of these approaches are reversible in nature. That means after withdrawal of this particular thing, it may be recovered back. So they are going to use micro bubbles as contrast agents. So these micro bubbles are having a diameter of approximately one to 10 micrometers and they are made up of semi-rigid lipid and albumin shells encapsulated with perfluorocarbon. And they are systemically administered into the blood. And an acoustic energy principle is going to be exerted and that is going to reach to the blood brain barrier opening the tight junction. And they are going to cause the increased permeability and improved delivery of the drugs to the brain. So collaboration of the low intensity focus ultrasound and micro bubbles is called as MBFUS system. So they have tried to deliver different anti-tumor agents to this part by using this particular technology and they are successful in delivering these particular anti-tumor agents by using the MBFUS system. And MBFUS technique coupled with liposomes showed optimum effects of doxorubicin in rat glioma. And FES grafted gold nanoparticles guided through MRA were delivered to brain tumor model. So these are all the trials, preclinical trials that are taken up for delivering the drugs to the brain. And now successfully delivered the nanoparticles encapsulating reporter gene combined with MRA guided FES to transfect the brain it is a clue for future prospects of this technology for gene therapy. And the, another technology that is used is high intensity focused ultrasound, which is effectively applied for reversible disturbance of the blood brain barrier and promotion of the drug distribution to the brain. And these are all the techniques that are used for delivery of the drugs to the brain. And the other approach is biochemical blood brain disruption strategy. So some vasoactive compounds like leukotrienes, bradykinin, or histamine appear to selectively increase the permeability in abnormal brain capillaries. However, these vasoactive compounds are not going to show the effect in the normal brain capillaries due to the enzymatic barrier that may, which may inactivate the vasoactive. So intracarotid infusion of these leukotrienes, bradykinin, and other vasoactive agents can increase the delivery of the diseased tissue. So bradycanin histamine and the systemic bradycanin analog of RMP7 infusion selectively opened the blood tumor barrier in experimental animal. And the biochemical mechanism is not yet fully elucidated, but it was established that RMP7 is mediated specifically through bradycanin B2 receptors. So these are the recent patents that are obtained on blood brain disruption, blood brain barrier disruption. And this is the technique, drug delivery across the blood brain barrier using magnetically heatable entities. And the second one is also in the similar way. And it is going to design an apparatus and a method for altering the magnetic fields for heating compositions, comprising magnetically, magnetically heatable entities that have been targeted at or near the blood brain barrier. The non-invasive strategies include chemical, biological, and colloidal. So chemical lipophilic analogs, chemical drug delivery systems, prodrugs, molecular packaging, and biological receptor vector mediated delivery of chemical chimeric peptides or self-penetrating peptide mediated drug delivery and viral vectors. And colloidal, we have various colloidal systems like micellized liposomes, nanoparticles, solid lipid nanoparticles, dendrimers, et cetera, which are being used for targeting to the brain. So the lipophilic analogs, 
The major advantage is lipid solubility is the key factor for causing the passive diffusion into the blood-brain barrier. And the block P value is going to be very critical and it should be in the range of 1.5 to 2.5 and it should have good CNS permeability. So hydrophobic analogs of small hydrophilic drugs more readily penetrate the blood-brain barrier. So here the limitations are low selectivity of the drug molecules and poor tissue distribution. And lipophilic analogs can also affect the rate of oxidative metabolism by cytochrome, cytochrome P450 and other enzymes. The second approach is chemical drug delivery systems where we'll be doing some chemical manipulation by bioremovable moieties. So it is a cyclic process. First, they identify the target or moiety and by using the targeting and site-specific and locking in of the drug, they may be doing this approach or by using a modified function by using the various lipophilizers, certain for protecting the certain functions of the drug molecule and prevention of the premature unwanted metabolic conversions. So we can start from here and go to this place, or we can start from here to go to this place. So either way, the approaches are going to be practiced by using a retrometabolic drug design loop. And finally, the drug along with the other moieties are going to be coupled together to manipulate the chemical nature of this particular drugs to suit the particular targeting approach. And the classification of CDS based on in vivo target is done by using enzymatic, physicochemical, or site-specific enzyme-activated or receptor-based. So the physical site-specific traffic properties by sequential metabolic conversions resulting in altered transport properties are specific enzymes which are found primarily exclusively or at higher activity at the site of action. That means only at that particular site the drug is going to be released or enhance the selectivity and activity through transient reversible binding to target receptors. That means the receptors are going to be identified and they are going to be targeted and only at the site they are going to be reversed and the drug is going to be released at the site. And the application of the systems have been tried using the various drugs classes like hormones, anti-infective agents, and anti-cancer agents. And estradiol CDS is the most advanced and is currently undergoing phase one and phase two clinical trials by using this particular chemical drug delivery modifications. And we all know what are the products on administration, they undergo chemical conversion by metabolic process before becoming an active pharmacological agent. And morphine cannot enter the CNS, but after latentation via escalation, the hydro of the of the both hydroxyl group, morphine can easily intervene the BBB and reach an effective concentration in brain. Similarly, is the case with dopamine, which is L-dopa is highly effectively transported across the blood-brain barrier to convert into dopamine. So these are all the approaches used for product and. There is a difference between the prodrug and CDS because we may have a doubt. Even prodrug is getting converted into the active pharmacological molecule in the particular site of action. CDS is also doing the same. So, what is the major difference between prodrug and CDS? So, in case of prodrug, it is an inactive moiety and it is a single step activation and it helps to enter the blood brain barrier. And CDS is also an inactive moiety and before reaching it has to undergo multiple step activation. And it also helps in entry, but also in locks in the drug. That means in the case of the prodrug, after evaluation of the pharmacological moiety, it may not be locked properly at the site of action. But in the case of CDS, the locking of this particular drug at the site of action is very, very useful. And hence CDS is more superior to prodrug. Molecular packing is another approach where they will be using the different peptides like enkephalin, TRH, or Kyotophen, etc. And they are going to be deactivated by universal peptidase. So for peptide delivery of the following need to be achieved simultaneously. So for using this, for, you, for the delivery of these peptides, we have to have the three approaches simultaneously administered. One is enhanced passive transport by increasing the lipophilicity. We have to create the enzymatic stability 
and we should avoid the premature degradation using the lock-in mechanism. So this is a complex approach and that is called as molecular packing. And it consists of the following factors. So we'll be taking the peptide itself in the center point and we'll have a redox targeter T and we'll have spacer function consisting of strategically used amino acids to ensure timely removal of the charged targeter from the peptide. And we have bulky lipophilic moiety attached through an ester bond and C terminal adjuster at the carboxy terminal to enhance the lipid solubility and to disguise the peptide. So that means we are keeping the peptide in the center and encircling this peptide with all the four moieties like redox targeted, spacer function, bulky lipophilic moiety, and C terminal adjuster. And the other approach is receptor vector mediated. So this is based on the chemical coupling of a non-transportable peptide pharmaceutical to a transportable peptide or protein, which undergoes receptor mediator or absorptive, absorptive mediated transcytosis through the blood-brain barrier. So they try to transport the opioid peptide P endorphin directly coupled to the vector, which is catenized albumin. So binding of the vector to its receptor on the luminal surface of the brain capillary endothelial cells initiate the endocytosis. The pharmacological activity of the chimeric peptide may be released by the enzymatic cleavage, and it may be a cleavable linkage between the vector and the drug if employed by exocytosis at the albuminal plasma membrane and release into the brain interstitial space. So they tried to transport a non-transportable protein B endorphin, which was linked to the transportable protein catenized albumin via diffuse disulfide linkage. And this chimeric peptide was successfully transcytosed into the brain. And it was enzymatically cleaned into the parenchyma by a thiol reductase. So major carriers that are used for these peptide transport for this particular mechanism are nothing but nanoparticles. So they tried to evaluate the judovidin and lamivudin across the blood-brain barrier and found to have 8 to 20% and 10 to 18% fold increase when administered along with polybutyl cyanoacrylate nanoparticles. So cell penetra penetrating peptide mediated drug delivery. So it contains a sequence of highly basic amino acids which confer a positive charge on the peptide. So they interact with the cell surface with our receptor independent mechanism and transport the molecules that are coupled to them. So the advantage is the ability of carrying the biomacromolecules, biological activity of the coupled molecules is preserved and low cellular toxicity and high efficiency. So in this, the proteins are going to be coupled with basic amino acids, which are going to confer a positive charge and they are going to be crossing the blood-brain barriers. The most frequently studied peptides are the TAT peptide. So endocytosis and macropinocytosis are the two proposed primary mechanisms that have been proposed to explain the cellular uptake of this particular TAT peptide. So the TAT protein migrates from the infected cells that produce this protein to the uninfected cells and initiate viral replication. The main benefit of it is it is going to couple along with the efficient delivery of the molecules and biological activity of the coupled molecule is preserved. And the size of molecule is being transported is not a rate limiting step for this particular TAT molecule. And it is employed for facilitating the delivery of biomacromolecules across the blood brain barrier. So the viral vectors are going to be a promising tool for gene delivery at specific sites in the brain. And they are directly injected into the cerebral lateral ventricles, which will be delivered throughout the CNS. And possibility of injecting at multiple sites to cover a large volume, and which are agents like mannitol and heparin also been tested to promote the distribution of these vectors. And they tried like CNS delivery like HSV, lentivirus, retrovirus, recombinant, AVV, 
simian virus, etc. <clears throat> the major disadvantage is they have the unwanted deleterious immune response and changes in the properties of the delivered virus due to the endogenous recombination and mutagenic behavior leading to oncogenesis. So we have colloidal carriers like colloidal uh, carriers like liposomes, nanoparticles, solid lipid nanoparticles, dendrimers, etc. And by using a targeting moiety, we can target them to various diseases like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, etc. So the advantages and drawbacks of this nanomedicine is protection of loaded molecules, visibility in type of molecules should be loaded, intra interventions on distributions and metabolism, active targeting to difficult to reach targets, and specific and selective delivery to cells, wide range of biomedical applications. Major drawbacks include limits in formulation efficiency, toxicity, and translation to clinic, scaling up, in vitro and in vivo correlation is very, very difficult and cost effectiveness. And these are the patents that are obtained for nanomedicines for the brain delivery. And we have the intranasal roots, the neural pathways connecting the nasal mucosa and the brain provide potential routes for non-invasive drug delivery. And drugs with low molecular weight and higher lipophilicity generally favor this rapid intranasal uptake into the CNS. So they have tried like uh, pumps like Infuset pump, Minimet PIMS systems, and Metronic synchro Synchromet systems are the systems which have been developed for delivering drugs directly into the brain interstitium. The limitations are the concentration and the efficiency of the drug delivery is going to be diminished with increasing molecular weight of the drug and the dosage forms may cause mucosal irritation due to natal pathology and needs to be avoided or a long-term usage. Our factory, this is the mechanism by which it is going to be uh, transported from the nasal cavity into the brain directly. If it goes into the neurological pathway, it goes directly into the brain. If it is going into the nasal vein or airway, it is getting um, circulated through the blood brain barrier into the brain or from the blood flow into the lymph flow onto the brain like this. And antiphyretic delivery is a method to deliver the ionized molecules across the blood brain barrier by using an externally applied electric current and it is having a programmable transport and they'll allow for enhanced drug delivery into the brain and con under controlled manipulation. And these are the other routes by which the targeted delivery of the drugs was achieved to the brain. And these are the devices, which I'm not going to waste much time on this. And as part of our work, I congratulate one of my students who carried out this uh, brain uh, targeting of drugs to the brain in collaboration with IICT Hyderabad at Andhra University Visakhapatnam. We developed a project and we developed the docetoxel nano solid lipid nanoparticles for targeting to the brain for treating to the glioblastoma multiforme by conjugating with angiopep 2. So initially we prepared the docetoxel loaded solid lipid nanoparticles by using the solvent evaporation technique by using the docetoxel glyceryl monosterate soil esteine and stearic acid this is the mechanism by which we prepared the solid lipid nanoparticles and we have carried out the different trials for optimizing the process parameters and evaluated the solid lipid nanoparticles for the particle size, polydispersion index, jeta potential, etc. And this is the synthesis of the angiopep2 conjugated docetoxel solid lipid nanoparticles. And angiopep2 is a 19 amino acid peptide and used as targeting ligand peptide. So the object of this work is, so far this approach has not been tried for trans uh, targeting the docetoxel to the brain because it is having a poor lipophilicity transfer across the blood-brain barrier 
and we try to conjugate with this particular peptide and try to transfer this particular drug to the brain tumor. So we carried out the in vitro drug release studies in different media. One is in pH 7.4 phosphate buffer saline. The other one is pH 6.8 sodium acetate buffer. And the third one is fetal bovine serum, 50%. So in fetal bovine serum, we are able to get the good control release over a period of 120 hours of this particular drug. So we carried out the in vitro cytotoxicity studies of the various nanoparticles for comparative purposes. We have uh, compared the Blanc's SLN, drug, uh, the, uh, the pure drug, and the pure drug solid lipid nanoparticles, and the angiopep conjugated solid lipid nanoparticles, and the percent cell viability in two different cell lines of U87 MG cells and GL261 cells. Uh, in both the cases, uh, the ASLN could give a significant uh, reduction in the cell viability compared to the other nanoparticles or the pure drug. And we have carried out the cellular uptake studies uh, by conjugating these particular solid lipid nanoparticles with coumarin and taking these photographs at different time points. And we could, you can see the ACSLN solid lipid nanoparticles could give more cellular uptake compared to the pure solid lipid nanoparticles. That clearly indicated that the angiopep conjugated uh, solid lipid nanoparticles of the drug could easily reach to the cellular uh, cancer cell lines more effectively compared to the pure nanoparticles. And competitive binding assay was also performed by us indicating the suitability of these particular ASLN nanoparticles compared to the other nanoparticles. And we have carried out the cell apoptosis studies also, which confirmed the superiority of the A solid lipid, uh, the angiopep solid lipid nanoparticles significantly. We are indicating statistically also all these parameters with a statistical value of P 0. Point, less than 0. 0.0001. You can see how significantly it is giving a very good correlation. And we carried out the in vivo studies by taking a drug uh, dose of the docetoxel equivalent to 10 mg per, per kg of the body weight. And initially, the mice were introduced with the glioma by introducing 1,000 cells per three microliters in PBS. And after the seventh day, treatment was started. And each group was uh, consisting of uh, six animals. And the dose was administered for three days for three weeks at certain time points. And the animals were sacrificed at the different time points. And the brain tissue was harvested for histopathological studies. And we also carried out the real-time fluorescence imaging studies also at different time points of four hours, eight hours, 12 hours, and 24 hours. So this is how the glioma was introduced into the rat by introducing these GL261 tumor cells into the animal. And we have carried out the pharmacokinetic studies of the DSLN, ASLN, that means the pure drug, solid lipid nanoparticles, and angiopept conjugated solid lipid nanoparticles of the drug, along with a taxoter, which is a commercial formulation. And it was observed that there is a significant difference in all the pharmacokinetic parameters of the particular uh, drug from ASLN compared to DSLN or taxoter. And we have carried out the tissue distribution studies also from heart, kidney, spleen, lungs, and liver. Because how the drug is getting distributed over a period of time at different parts of the body before reaching to the brain was also evaluated. And we have carried out the anti-glioma efficiency studies by using these particular studies. And we have stained the brain after isolating it from the animal and concluded that there is a reduction in the Thing. And we have carried out the NYO real-time fluorescence imaging also, and in which we have carried out ASLN, DIR, DIR SLN, and you can see the significant difference was observed compared to ASLN and DIR SLN. So we could conclude that we concluded that angiopep 2 conjugated nanoparticles showed higher toxicity enhanced cellular uptake 
and higher apoptosis and morphological changes which proved that targeted nanoparticles could affect efficiently deliver docetaxel in the cells thereby causing cell death in both u7 mg and gl261 cell lines and in vivo pharmacokinetic studies in glioma induced mice revealed significantly higher plasma concentration of asl and compared to marketed formulation texoter and in vivo real time fluorescence imaging studies displayed that docetaxel accumulation glioma after asl injection was higher than that of dsln so the asln showed better anti glioma effect than dsln or texoter which was proved by enhanced survival of the glioma bearing animals and we published a very good paper in the european journal of pharmaceutics and biopharmaceutics which has a very good impact factor and this work was carried out by amrita in collaboration with uh, ramakrishna the principal scientist at iict hyderabad along with me of course the other uh, students are also associated partly in carrying out this study that's why they are also the co-authors of this particular paper so finally i would like to conclude that whenever there is a failure of potent drugs reaching to the brain that may be attributed to the shortcomings of the drug delivery methods and the barriers that are going to prevent the entry of the drugs into the brain so we need to have thorough insight into the molecular mechanism of cns which will be providing some information and strategies for targeting the drugs to the cns diseases can be developed and by combination of these strategies we can have the effective disruption of these barriers of the brain and by designing a suitable dosage form by for the delivery of the drugs we can have successful entry of the drugs into the brain for addressing the various problems of the brain and finally i would like to thank one and all especially the staff management principal and organizer of sri vidyaniketan college of pharmacy and all the participants for their patient listening for this particular talk given on brain strategies and finally i would like to thank my students who are helpful in making this presentation in a more lovely way because i used to depend on my students no doubt i know very good about this powerpoint presentation etc but because of the paucity of time i always ask my students to prepare the basic template which i always edit and finalize to my presentation and for which i thank all my students who are in the backdrop for making this lively presentation to the audience thank you one and all for giving me this excellent opportunity to, to share my thoughts on the brain uh, targeting thank you everybody thank you sir that was a fabulous session with loads of knowledge transfer thanks a lot sir for your beautiful session now the session is open for queries and i request mr m sabari sir to handle the q and a session welcome to q and a session good afternoon sir so question from mr shake feroz what are the long term side effects of ultrasound waves on blood brain barrier yeah they are not fully established honestly because majority of these trials are still in the developing state and hence nobody is sure about the long term side effects of this ultrasound waves honestly okay sir thank you sir so next question from dr p darani prasad can hydrophilic drugs be targeted to bring yes we can because by introducing some hydrophobic moieties are Uh, embedding them into hydrophilic moiety, hydrophobic moiety, we can certainly target the drugs into the brain. Or if the molecular size of the hydrophilic molecule is less, certainly it can be targeted to the brain, brain by using proper strategy. Nothing uh, difficult. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Next question from Mr. Venkata Panidip. What are the evaluation tests for BBB crossed drugs? BBB. crossed drugs 
Uh, it is frankly a very wide question. It all depends on the type of the dosage form or type of the mechanism we are going to evaluate. For example, if we are going to evaluate the blood-brain barrier disruption, we have to see how the drug is getting transported before disruption and after the, after the disruption, the concentration, the vesicular nature, all these things are to be investigated. If it is related to the dosage form, first of all, we have to evaluate the characteristics of the dosage forms like the nanoparticles or the, some vesicular systems like polydispersity index, particle size, all these parameters. And is it capable of having the capacity to cross the blood-brain barrier with respect to its lipophilicity or the part log p value, et cetera? So all these are to be combined together only. We can have the specific comment that it can disrupt the blood-brain barrier and it can reach to the site of action. But vaguely, we cannot say this is the only test or these are only two or three tests to evaluate the disruption of the blood-brain barrier. That is my opinion, having some experience in the research of this uh, brain targeting. Okay, sir, thank you. Next question from Mr. Yogeshwar Rao. What is the favorable size of drug to target the brain? Uh, favorable size, I already mentioned in my presentation, the molecular weight less than... Less than 0.8. Yeah. Locking value, all these are the characteristics we are given. But even proteins and peptides are also targeted to the brain by using the other strategies which I have already mentioned by coupling. So all these are Thank only you. just uh, 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 say what we can take it as uh, the, we cannot take them as benchmarks, but only just limits. That's it. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you for answering the questions. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Mohan Lakshmi, a vice principal of Pharmacy College. Yeah. Um, sir, I uh, thank you, first of all, for your very elaborate uh, presentation on your research outcomes on brain targeting. Uh, sir, hope you remember that you were with us in 2011 yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. as a part of our TSIR-sponsored uh, seminar. I think your husband is the principal at the time. Yeah, uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Correct. Uh, sir, uh, uh, in, uh, during that time in your presentation, I very, very clearly remember you saying that at the end of your presentation, even now I remember uh, the various activities that a uh, pharmacy person, uh, the various branches uh, supposed to do, like uh, what a SUTIC should do, what an analysis should do, what a pharmacognosist should do. And also you spoke uh, about how they all can collaborate because at that point of time, we never thought of collaborating. Uh, yes. So it is uh, your word that we have taken seriously. After and, that, we started collaborating with each knowledge. other in within the institution. Uh, so with that, we were able to, we have our collaborator, uh, Narahari here, we have uh, from Sutik, we have Jairam here, uh, Pharmacology. We, uh, we three collaborated and we were able to do a very good research and able to publish those outcomes in a very good paper. So uh, yes. thank you for that. And um, just I want to ask you one thing, sir. Uh, so, uh, you told me this, you told us this in 2011, and now this is 2020. There is no much changes that has happened in terms of collaboration. Uh, for example, uh, leaving the within institution collaboration, you just uh, take, uh, for example, the city, Chirupati city. Uh, you see, uh, after that, we got uh, MHRD Institute like ISER, we got IIT. Uh, we have already a very good number of uh, you know, the government universities, we have private uh, players as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, the very good ecosystem that we have in Tirupati, and if you take Hyderabad, uh, same kind of uh, situation here, the National Laboratories of Biology, Chemistry, ISB, NIPER. So, but the collaboration aspect is very, very lagging, much lagging. So, what is, what is your experience in this? In this uh, it is the attitude or the ego that is playing the role or it is uh, the credit, carry, uh, credit sharing thing that is playing the role and what is your experience? Can you uh, throw some light on it? Hey, How can we improve it? My opinion about collaboration is it is always open. It is always open for the persons with the same heart. But unfortunately, we are not able to come out of the particular phobia in which the people who are owning the instruments, for example, the institutes, what you are mentioning are having, 
very good infrastructure and equipment facilities okay. and according to my experience with all these instruments everyone is going to concentrate on specific instruments for example x is holding four instruments y is holding five instruments z is holding 10 instruments they never allow even the x and y to use the z's instrument or z is not y is x is not going to allow the y or something like that in the institute itself the reason being if they use it will be spoiled but unfortunately we are in a very advanced stage of learning where more use more will be the effectiveness of any instrument unfortunate thing is that for example we have a very good nmr facility in andhra university which was procured uh, almost 5 years back and the earlier uh, in charge who is of the particular center is no way connected with the nmr or anything because by virtue of something i don't want to go into the politics he was uh, the responsible person of that particular nmr center and during his tenure the nmr is completely gone fortunately it is in warranty and i forcefully requested the vice chancellor in the restart to nominate another man who knows something about this nmr and today it is earning almost 14 to 15 lakhs per annum on average that means it is meeting its maintenance costs by the outside consultancy works so he is struggling a lot to make it live even when the recent budget alloc allocation of our andhra university some, some of the senior professors questioned what is the need for 8 lakhs of budget to nmr center then i categorically told being the principal i told them the liquid nitrogen itself is going to cost minimum 6 lakhs per annum unless you keep the liquid nitrogen continuously in the center the nmr is going to docks air conditioning the temperature maintenance all the air conditioners must be in continuous running all through 24 hours so there should be at least two standby air conditioners which should run so all these are things what should be explained to the administrators to convince that there is a budget requirement of 6 to 8 lakhs and amc bill they are saying why should we spend 8 lakhs whenever it gets repair we'll just call the amc then i told you ask the quotation they will give 15 lakhs because the air fare of the engineer and stay charges they are going to have minimum 10 to 15 lakhs so all these are to be convinced by the respective people who are involved in the research to the administrators unfortunately majority of the institutes this gap is very wide and nobody is coming forward to bridge the gap as you are saying after my talk with you you got inspired and we doing some collaboration within the college in the same way first to develop a rapport with the respective laboratory professors who are in charge of these instruments don't ask for research initially just start developing a contact by inviting them to your college or going to their institute occasionally for some clarifications or something like that you inculcate some interest in their minds that this per these persons can be useful for our research also so that you can start a collaborative research in near future but not immediately you just go to icer or iit or something say that i do, i just want to have some collaboration with you no professor is ready to do it that is my experience in fact the work what i have presented in the last part of my presentation it took nearly 2 years for the candidate to get registered in andhra university because of various technical hurdles myself and ramakrishna fought like anything to get the candidate registered in andhra university we fought like anything in, in spite of having good rapport in the university i used to run from pillar to post to get the file cleared by everybody and finally she is registered and you can see she produced a very good paper in fact we produced four good papers i have cited only one paper related to this present work so these are all the technical hurdles initially we face it but according to my feeling within within 1 to 2 years it is going to be a collaborative age nobody can escape this collaboration because the education policy is being drafted by the government and the scales of measurements for the success of a researcher not by virtue of his own research by virtue of his collaboration then only the scale is going to be more good compared to the individual work so in such cases 
we can certainly have very good opportunities for collaborative research in future, hopefully, within one to two years. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your opinion and, and ideas. Thank you, sir. Over to Bhirat. Thank you, sir. Thanks for your valuable session. Hope everybody have cleared their doubts. Now I am very much uh, proud of introducing today's chief guest. It is my pleasure to welcome our chief guest, Professor S. V. Satyanarayana, sir, Director, Academic and Planning, Jain to UA, Andhra Pradesh, for this symposium. And thank you for making it much pleasurable with your presence, sir. Now I would like to. Uh, call Professor K. Saravan Kumar, sir, to introduce today's chief guest, Professor S. V. Satinarayana Garu. A very good afternoon to all of you. I am happy and honored to introduce today's chief guest, Dr. S. V. Satinarayana Garu, Director, Academic and Planning. JNTUA for today's national e, e symposium valedictory ceremony. Dr. S. V. Satyanarayana Garu has acquired B.Tech degree from Usmania University and relocated to IIT Kanpur to get hold of his master's in 1992 and PhD in 2004. He has 25 years of teaching experience at JNTUA College of Engineering, Anantapuram, and two and a half years of research experience and IACT Hyderabad. Dr. S. V. Satyanarayana Garu is a professor at Department of Chemical Engineering, JNTUA College of Engineering, Anantapuram, and currently positioned as Director, Academic and Planning, Anantapuram, JNTUA, Andhra Pradesh. He has served in various administrative positions such as Director of Evaluation, Research and Development Director, Industrial Relation and Placements Director, Principal for Engineering College, Pulivendala, JNTUA, School of Continuing and Distance Education Director, Head of the Department for Chemical Engineering, Coordinator and Nodal Officer for various, various professional organizations. He was honored with the various prestigious awards, includes Best Scientist Award in Engineering Sciences by Government of Andhra Pradesh for the year 2017. Next, Best Teacher Award for the year 2013 by the Government of Andhra Pradesh. Next, Jawaharlal Nehru Gold Medal Award from Global Economic Progress and Research Association for the year 2013. 14. SAR has an immense contribution towards the uplift of research in focused area of chemical engineering, especially membrane technology includes gas separation, ultrafiltration, and membrane reactors. Currently, eight students are pursuing their PhD, and he has published 107 research papers in reputed international journals. 41 papers in international conferences and 61 papers in national conferences and authored one textbook. SAR has successfully completed 10 consultancy and sponsored projects for an amount more than 1.97 crores and guided 25 PhD students and 45 plus BTEC students. SAR has delivered more than 50 keynote and invited lectures in several universities and institutions and visited several countries for academic purpose, a few like USA, Japan, Malaysia, etc. SAR has organized several sponsored conferences and workshops and FDP. So he is the life member of many learned professional bodies and societies. He is the chairman of Board of Studies for Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology of JNTUA and Polymer Sciences of SK University, Anantapuramu. Now I request to welcome today's valedictory ceremony chief guest, 
Dr. S. V. Satyanarayana Gauru on delivering the symposium closing remarks. Thank you, sir. Sir, good afternoon. Good, good afternoon for your nice introduction. Good afternoon, sir. And a very good morning to very good afternoon to all of you. Good afternoon. Good morning, sir. The, good prin afternoon. the, uh, the principal of the college, Dr. Anna Balaji Gauru, vice principal, Dr. Mohan Lakshmi Madam, the coordinator, Dr. Sarvan Kumar, today's speaker. And uh, Professor K. V. Ramanamurthy Garu, faculty members of Sri Vidya Niketan Pharmacy, guests, invitees, participants, and my dear student friends. Once again, very good morning to all of you. It is indeed a pleasure and a great honor to have been given the opportunity to deliver the valedictory address on this three-day e-symposium on recent trends in pharmaceutical research organized by Sri Vijay Niketan College of Pharmacy. My heartfelt congratulations go out to all my fellow teachers on successfully completion of this online symposium. I want to convey my special thanks to the management, principal, vice principal, and organizing members for inviting me as a chief guest for this program. And it is a pleasure and privilege for, uh, privileged by your invitee Though I have visited several times to both engineering college and pharmacy college, this is the first time I am addressing the students that too through online. So once again, I am thankful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. At the dawn of crisis, we, the class of 2020, mourn for the losses of the world due to the COVID-19. But expecting this cursed moment will be ruined off in near days. But on the other side, like it is a blessing in disguise, COVID-19 pandemic provided the opportunity to all of us for online education and the students as well as teachers can listen to these stalwarts similar to, the, uh, similar to this conference. Like uh, Professor KPR Choudhury has delivered a lecture, Professor Gopal Krishnamurti has delivered a lecture, today Professor KV Ramanamurti Garu who delivered the lecture. And for these, uh, these stalwarts, it is very difficult to, to travel uh, from their place and delivering the lectures. But because of this online education, it, is, uh, it became possible for all of them to give the lectures. And uh, further, in this COVID-19 pandemic, the whole world came to know about the power of India, particularly in the pharmaceutical area. Many of the drugs are exported to various countries, including the, the great country like America. I truly believe higher education institutions are a depository of young talents and innovative minds. Particularly, some of the students are highly talented and they are not satisfied with the teaching what we are providing them. So therefore, it is a now turn and a free requisite for all the teachers to tune the requirement of the students. In the present pharmacy curriculum, we have an assignment system the teachers are suggested to give innovative or thought-provoking questions and see the responses of the students. Maybe some of the responses may not be good, but some of the re responses will be good. And uh, the teachers uh, have to look at these responses, very good responses or innovative responses and ideas. And these responses and ideas can be converted into the prototypes. So further, during this uh, pandemic, uh, the government of Andhra Pradesh conducted the GATE online classes as well as the GPAT online classes. And these lecture materials are available in the JNT website. And particularly the pharmacy students are uh, many of the pharmacy students have registered for this uh, uh, GPAT online classes and more than 2000 students have attended ev on every day. And uh, al almost uh, now it's almost uh, there is a 50,000 views are uh, uh, it has touched around 50,000 views. So the faculty and the students can utilize this material. And uh, as I told you, uh, the, teach, uh, the students are expecting a lot of things from the teachers and we have to deliver their requirement. Otherwise, otherwise they, they, they will not be satisfied. And uh, uh, so this online education, whatever we are using now, because of this COVID-19 pandemic now, uh, uh, should become a part and parcel of our life even after COVID-19 pandemic so we can listen to the lectures of uh, from various stalwarts. 
and uh, even in the industry people they may not be interested to visit the campus because uh, traveling is very difficult for them but they are ready to deliver the lectures through online and the colleges can utilize this opportunity and can invite the index industry experts to deliver the lectures after the college hours so this will be beneficial to the students to uh, know about the uh, to know about the latest things that are going on in the industry or industry requirement then uh, there is a new concept that is introduced by the uh, pci that is the practice school concept and there are a lot of things that can be done in a practice school concept so the faculty members can utilize this uh, opportunity of practice school and uh, uh, train the students and uh, uh, prepare the students for the industry requirement and coming to the today's topic the theme recent trends in pharmaceutical research was quite interesting and it propels the needs of quality research in the challenging areas of drug design and development research in a pharmaceutical science is a sky high and young researchers must lead this by focusing in challenging areas like microbiome research antibiotics discovery artificial intelligence and machine learning for drug discovery development phenotype screening bioprinting etc the policy makers uh, like now we have ramanamurthy gar here and uh, can convince the pci to introduce the modern curriculum into the pharmacy curriculum and because this pc whatever the curriculum given by the pca the entire uh, country is using the same curriculum so the pca should think about introducing the courses like data science artificial intelligence and machine learning into the pharmacy curriculum maybe i request the ramanamurthy garu to utilize i mean to use these office good officers uh, to see that the pca can look into this issue because now the data science is one of the most important thing because we are taking the input data and output data of a real industry and based on that we are making the model and the, whatever the efficiency or whatever the uh, whatever the expected uh, expected efficiency for future if you are going to vary the operating parameters will be very very good so we can expect a 90% 99% efficiency whereas if you are going to use the conventional modeling things maybe we can expect 80 85% uh, efficiency in addition to this advances in techniques like a super critical fluid extraction particularly maybe the i don't know whether the students of pharmacy knows about this uh, super critical fluid extraction or not so super critical fluid extraction particularly the carbon dioxide uh, fluid can be uh, carbon dioxide as a fluid can be used for isolation of the herbal uh, biomarkers executing in the vitro uh, in vitro and in silico tools for drug, drug design especially implementation of the principles of thermodynamics and the solubility uh, solubility parameter theory for selection of the solvent and the prediction of the interactions development of the co crystals because now uh, ultimately whatever the product that we are going to get it that is the most important thing so what is the crystal size that we are getting maybe if the crystal size is uh, maybe bigger macro scale macro size maybe it may be nano size so the development of the co crystals co crystals for the drugs implementation of six sigma concepts i don't know how many of you know about this six sigma concepts and this six sigma concept is the most important thing and the industry is looking from all of us to uh, uh, to uh, to have the knowledge on the six sigma concept uh, the meaning of the six sigma concept is if if you are going to prepare 1 lakh uh, components uh, there is a probability that uh, only one component is going to fail and the remaining all components are going to work so when you when a pharmacy student goes to the industry whatever the drug or whatever the tablet that we are going to develop so that develop should work in all conditions and maybe uh, out of 1 lakh tablets that we are going to prepare maybe one tablet may be failing uh, may maybe fail so and another important concept uh, people now are going to talk about the product quality is the most important thing and the another uh, in, in interested area in all areas of in, uh, engineering as well as the pharmacy is a process intensification i think i don't know how many of you know the word about the process intensification we want to get the lower uh, same efficiency at a lower energy requirement and the lower space requirement 
and one of the process intensification maybe the students who are listening to this uh, validatory address may not be knowing may not imagine what is this process intensification i can give you one example when i was uh, when i was doing my masters at iit kanpur there was a super computer only four super computers were available all over the india and one of the super computer is available at iit kanpur and the students uh, belongs to chemical engineering maybe a civil engineering mechanical engineering are not allowed even to enter into that room only the students of computer science electrical maybe electronic students are allowed to enter into that room so uh, today we have a laptops maybe we have a uh, android mobile phones or maybe some other mobile phones this uh, laptops can do the same job what a super computer can do what we have done in the last 20 years particularly uh, in the area of computers research we are we are able to reduce the size requirement we are able to reduce the space requirement but we are getting the same um, efficiency or whatever the things that we want to process it we are able to do it so even in the case of uh, pharmaceutical uh, research this process intensification is the most important thing uh, we want to get the uh, quality product at a low energy requirement and the low space requirement and uh, even the student the students of pharmacy uh, maybe the faculty or the students of pharmacy or the industry have to look into this uh, one of the important area where how to apply the principles of the process intensification to intensify the process applications of mathematical models for in vivo analysis of drugs without using the wet lab experiments is also one of the important area now people are talking about establish of a new dissolution protocols using a bio relevant media in order to obtain better uh, ivc uh, drug repurposing using bioinformatics tools will be focused for the need of the hour the rise of the quantum physics maybe the students of pharmacy they have studied the physics in the uh, intermediate and the, most of them they have forgotten but the quantum physics in drug discovery will strive your research in a smarter way and a pave uh, path for innovation of new hits and designing of the novel biomarkers for challenging threats to the mankind in addition to this personal uh, personalized medicines as becoming a paradigm shifting trend in healthcare the egomony of one size fits all this is the most important thing everybody should understand one size fits all drugs are increasingly challenged by the novel innovative modalities and therapies on the other hand the advent uh, advent of uh, personal personalized medicine is a only possible with a more personalized system for health assessment new robust biomarkers and the novel approaches to run and monitor the clinical trials and uh, in addition to this maybe the first lecture what you listened from the uh, professor k p r choudhary garu that is about the optimization of the formulations when you talk about the optimization of the formulations maybe the students of uh, uh, pharmacy or the faculty of the pharmacy they are going to formulate different uh, formulations and they are going to see which formulation is giving a better results but i i request all the students as well as the faculty to have the interaction with the engineering student the engineering students knows about a lot of optimization tools like uh, genetic algorithms simulated annealing and uh, so other advanced uh, techniques so you need not to uh, you need not to know about the algorithm you need not to know about the software but you can use that software as a tool to uh, find out the better formulation the meaning of the better formulation here exactly um, exactly we are going to get the uh, precise values of the parameters maybe uh, solvent quantity maybe a drug quantity maybe some other parameters precise value you are going to get it where we are going to have the i efficiency so the interdisciplinary nature is the most important thing and fortunately the vidyaniketan engineer uh, pharmacy college is uh, is in the uh, vidyaniketan engineering college so the faculty as well as the student should interact with the faculty members of the uh, engineering colleges and try to learn something uh, about the optimization technique and uh, most of the times when the, when the students the, uh, when the pharmacy student they says it's optimization i i i don't convince the world like uh, uh, optimization always i tell them that don't use the word like optimization you say best condition because you are not doing any uh, mathematical techniques to find out the best optimization uh, values so uh, instead of calling as a optimization you have to call it as a best values 
so now to avoid that best values so the students of pharmacy the faculty should know something about the optimization technique which are, which are well known to the engineering students as well as the engineering faculty and they can take this formulation data and to find out the exact precise values of the uh, precise values of the what do you call it uh, uh, formulations so um, um, finally according to the darwin it is not the strongest of the species that is going to survive not the most intelligent it is going to survive but the one who is the most responsive to change is going to survive so the students as well as the faculty should respond to the this covid 19 pandemic and uh, expose uh, and uh, use this uh, covid 19 pandemic as a blessing in disguise and already we are uh, uh, seeing lot of advantages with the uh, this uh, and this online education system and uh, it is a given opportunity for all of us to listen to the lectures from the various stalwarts in the areas and uh, even the students uh, understand but still we have the problem of uh, networking i am very sure uh, the government of india as well as the government of andhra pradesh will work in the area of to providing the good internet facility or networking facility to uh, to provide the uh, opportunity for the each and every student to, to listen the lectures delivered by the experts not only by the experts the teachers also and one one more important thing the teachers who have attended uh, uh, to this uh, three days uh, conference i am really pity about their uh, situation because now you are exposed now you are exposed means earlier uh, our teaching is only in the uh, contained to the four walls of the room but now everybody is listening to your lecture your uh, lecture so what what you have to see uh, you have to you have to be ready for the this challenge and you should prepare well before delivering the lectures so uh, my greetings and wishes to all the teams members as well as the delegates who attended this uh, three day um, uh, national e symposium and once again i am thankful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity i hope i have delivered whatever the best i can do thank you one and all thank you very much thank you very much sir thanks a lot for your valuable thank lecture. you sir thank you um, thank you thank you session is further proceeded with virtual presentation of today's speaker in the presence of chief guest by our convener dr anna balaji sir sudeep sir Sir, once again, very good afternoon to you, sir. Thank you, thank you. Sir, sir, the first time uh, I heard your uh, lecture was in Varangal, in uh, Pharmacy College there, in 2009. Uh, okay. Uh, Dr. Nagraj. Afterwards, from that time, I have been trying to bring you as a subject expert and uh, key uh, key person to meet our students. Uh, Of course, I worked in one college in Varangal. Then uh, last year I shifted here. So my eleven years dream is coming true today. That you have visited us, but but chill. So once the college reopens again, I invite you to come here and uh, share Thank your you. enormous enormous knowledge and your uh, motivational talk with our uh, young teachers and students. With these few words uh, from the bottom of my heart, I uh, thank you. accepting our invitation and coming and delivering uh, today's uh, lecture uh, we are presenting you a small e certificate which will be emailed to you the hard copy of this will be posted to you after the college okay. thank you once again sir thank, thank you, you. Sir. thank you sachran yaar for your inputs related you, to pharmacy education we are, we are taking care of your suggestions related to artificial intelligence and other things and other things six sigma uh, all these things we are teaching in the pg level in fact okay but we have to bring it to the ug level sir that is the most important thing yeah, and but, maybe, but, maybe maybe you have to introduce the concepts so yeah, you have to introduce the concepts. intelligence and other ideas are certainly really good and we are trying our level best to introduce in uh, b farm there is no doubt we are uh, and optimization in fact i can proudly say andhra university syllabus is very strong related to optimization approaches sir. we use okay there and we use uh, very we give very good training in andhra university compared to because we we are slightly different from the mpharm syllabus of pci 
and we are using it so we are stronger in uh, that particular part sir yes yeah and, and because just to be, uh, just to tell you sir uh, uh, i was a research advisory committee for the pharmaceutical sciences yeah uh, for the three years three years and yes. uh, the, the phd students used to come and present their work in the re research review meetings as well as the pre submission seminars yes, and yes. Uh, they use always they use the word like optimization and really they have not done optimization i know it i know it i get yeah. your comment and i welcome your comment in fact we also fight like that in our different meetings in different, i also fight like that whenever i attend such meetings yes sir <laughs> and and another important thing sir in the recent gpat inaugural function yeah. we have requested the minister for education uh, yeah. dr suresh yeah. to yeah. to to have the uh, pharmacy university yes yes because now our 35 affiliated colleges whatever we have with us uh, they yeah, are in, uh, our dream is going to be fulfilled in fact yeah they are in the technical university similarly the pharmacy colleges affiliated to jnt kakinada Uh, there are no pharmacy experts in the university yes and these people uh, the principals uh, faculty members students uh, um, the people at the university they are unable to understand their problems yes so keeping that in mind our uh, vice chancellor professor sinwas kumar garu requested the dr suresh to have a separate pharmacy university for all the pharmacy colleges i hope that will be fulfilled hopefully because it is a long pending demand right from uh, 15 20 years back sir It's because we conducted indian pharmaceutical congress in 95 at visakhapatnam at the uh. time itself the then chief minister promised that we will create and sir, again in uh, 2000 2002 at hyderabad again the then chief minister promised we are creating a university but it is going sir, on, but still nobody has done anything let us hope at least in this regime we expect the formation of a university for pharmacy thank and now presently your vice chancellor is very dynamic maybe you can utilize the uh, whatever the yes. interactions network that he is having so you can have the pharmacy university yes yes sir thank you for interacting with us sir thank you thank you very much sir thank you very much sir thank you sir now it is the time for virtual felicitation of today's chief guest sv satyanarayana garu by the convener sir once again very good afternoon to you sir thank you very much for accepting our invitation to be today's uh, chief guest for the validatory function and uh, giving us a very good uh, message and lot of inputs that has been uh, kindly noted by us uh, thank you very much for uh, sparing your valuable time and accepting the invitation you have been on board uh, i think with the, our engineering institution and uh, uh, you, i you have been visiting our uh, institutions uh, often i request you to spend some time for pharmacy college also next time you come here and uh, kindly bless us at that time thank you very much sir we are presenting you a small uh, token of appreciation uh, for your presence here uh, uh, with the e certificate that we email to you sir thank you very much okay. so thank you sir thank you very much it is my pleasure to addressing the students and whatever the knowledge that i have in the pharmacy education i shared with uh, all the people maybe the uh, policy makers and rule makers should think about all these things and this practice school concept too, you have to follow uh, seriously sir sure sir Sorry. thank you sir as we are coming to the end of this e symposium i call upon professor s mohan lakshmi ma'am to propose out of thanks Am I audible? Is there a sound audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Yeah, well, a very warm, graceful, and healthy afternoon to all of you. I hope you all are staying safe during this challenging time of health disparity that we are going through. On behalf of the organizing team, I am delighted to have been given the pleasant duty of delivering the vote of thanks on the valedictory ceremony of this three days national e symposium. we have had an extremely useful and meaningful symposium i take this opportunity to express our gratitude to our honorable chairman dr m mohan babu garu and reverend ceo mr vishnu mansu for giving us 
an opportunity and unwavering support for all that we do at sri vidyaniketan for the benefit of our faculty students and the society i thank the chief guest for our inaugural ceremony professor k b chandrashekar garu vice chancellor krishna university masli patnam for gracing the inaugural session of the symposium and delivering a thought provoking address i take this opportunity to express our sincere thanks to the respected chief guest for the valedictory function professor sri satyanarayana garu director academic and planning jntu anandpur for gracing the occasion and delivering a very valuable address your presence today in this function has immensely enhanced its importance we have extremely grateful to you sir for all your support to see vidyaniketan since its inception we are all inspired by your great words i thank our advisor cum director professor l venugopal reddy garu for his motivation in organizing this event and delivering a very valuable address for the inaugural session of the symposium i thank profusely dr i sudarshan kumar garu director quality and development for gracing the occasion and delivering his insightful address to the audience i would like to thank our beloved principal for all words of wisdom and unstinted support that radiated a source of energy within us and greatly helped us towards the successful organization of this symposium thank you sir for being with us throughout this journey we have listened we have listened to a very powerful and thought provoking lectures from eminent experts professor k b r choudhary garu academic and research advisor k v s r siddhartha college of pharmacy and research director vikas institute of pharmaceutical sciences uh, professor t gopal krishnamurthy garu principal bapatla college of pharmacy and today we have professor k b ramna murthy garu principal andhra university college of pharmaceutical sciences andhra university thank you sir for sharing with us your research findings and opinions today we are immensely benefited finally an event like this cannot happen overnight we have been fortunate enough to be backed up by a team of very motivated and dedicated colleagues who know their job and are result oriented our organizing team headed by dr k sharona kumar head department of pharmaceutics and the organizing secretary of the symposium he is always keen in translating his ideas into reality in a resounding way this symposium is one among them i appreciate appreciate his dedication and unflinching coordination with his team members i appreciate and thank his team members dr narhari narayan mr sudhir kumar and mr pratap who worked tirelessly and meticulously and used all possible technicalities to make the best virtual symposium i appreciate and thank mr vetta mrs divya reka who gave a very powerful start to the symposium and moderating all the sessions in a dynamic way i appreciate and thank Ms. M. Divyashree for introducing the speaker to the audience. I appreciate and thank Mr. Sabarish for handling the question and answer session in a very effective way. I thank Mr. K. Tamilvanan, Mr. Srikanth, Mr. Sheikh Saroj, Mr. Ravindra Babu for their support behind the screen for the success of the symposium. I thank all the faculty members who actively participated in the symposium and helped one way or the other for its success. At the end, I would like to thank the distinguished audience. viewers and students for participating in this event thank you all once again stay home and stay safe take care of your health and your near and dear ones especially the elderly and the most vulnerable ones during this unprecedented time that we are going through i am sure that we are we as an institute and our nation will emerge stronger from these testing times thank you and namaskar thank you thank you, thank you madam thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you thank you we'll meet partner i sincerely thank each and every one in specific for making this a grand success thank you thank you all of you bye bye